Well, it is great for us to be here today to gather together uh, around the Word of God and to celebrate uh, the coming of Christ, the incarnation. And this morning, as I said earlier, marks our first Advent um, week in our Advent series entitled Watching and Waiting. Uh, As I said earlier, each Advent season, the church celebrates the first coming or the first Advent of Jesus in humility, while we also look with longing, with expectation and anticipation for the second coming, the second Advent of Jesus as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We are taking a break through our regular series in the letter to the Hebrews, and uh, we'll be spending the next uh, four weeks looking at different characteristics of Jesus Related to Christmas. So this morning we'll be looking at the hope that Jesus brings uh, in Christmas. So the hope of Christmas. But if you have your Bibles, uh, go ahead and turn to Romans chapter 8. We'll be looking at verses 31 through verse 39. Romans chapter 8, verses 31 through 39. And as is customary, let's go and stand as we read God's word. Romans chapter 8, verses 31 through verse 39. Hear now the word of the Lord. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died, and more than that, who was also raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of God? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to the slaughter. No, and all these things we are more than conquerors through him, who loved us, and I'm sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in creation, including finals, will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is God's word, and all God's people said, "Amen." Maybe not the end finals part, but you get what I mean. Well, again, this morning we are looking at the hope of Christmas. And the candle that we lit earlier represents, again, the hope of Christ in Christmas. And there are so many things that we need as humans, uh, besides the basic tangible necessities of life, such as food and clothing and shelter. We are created beings who need other things that are not connected to our five senses. Much like love, hope is a need that every human being has. And without hope, our spirits crumble. Uh, Without hope, life can seem meaningless. Uh, Hope gives us the strength to press through those dark nights, and hope breathes life, and it softens the heart, and even softens the heart of the most hard-hearted individual. And and we as people, we, we long for hope. We long for some assurance, for some certainty. We long for some redemption of things that are lost, and we long for reconciliation and and, uh, restoration for things that are broken, perhaps relationships, perhaps years felt wasted. But it is important that we have a proper understanding of what the biblical definition of hope is, because the word hope, it gets used a lot, and most... Most of the time, it's, it's not quite what Scripture means when it uses the word hope. For, for us, hope is more of the equivalent of I wish or it would be great if. It would have been great if the United States hadn't lost to Netherlands yesterday. That still really hurts. Terrible defense. Anyway, I, I hope my Christmas lights make it one more year because I just put them on my roof. I hope they last one more year. But, but hope is more than just a wish. It's more than just wishful thinking or some desired outcome. No, in Scripture, biblically, when we see the word hope used, the hope actually means a confident assurance. Hope means confidence. It means assurance. 
And the proper biblical definition of hope is that we have this confident expectation and this trust that God will do what he says he will do because we know the character of God and that God cannot lie. We saw that in Hebrews chapter 6. So hope in Scripture means confidence. It means assurance. It means steadfastness. And the Apostle Paul was saying in Romans chapter 5 that, that this hope does not disappoint. This assurance does not let us down. So hope is the knowledge of fact. Hope is a refuge. It gives us security, and our hope is singular. There is no equivalent or equal to it. And, and this Advent season, we're reminded that Jesus humbled himself, that he took on human flesh, that he dwelt among us to give us hope. But, but I want to take that a step further. Because while it's true that Jesus came to give us hope, that does not adequately express what took place in the incarnation. Because, you see, Jesus is not just a, a, merely a giver of hope, as if there was something that he could give apart from himself. No, Jesus is actually our very hope. He himself is our hope. And that's good news for us because Jesus doesn't just give us, you know, a little dabble of hope from himself. No, he actually gives us himself. And from there, we have this endless access to hope. We have this ceaseless and constant and steadfast person who is our hope. We don't have something outside of Jesus. We actually have Jesus himself. He himself is our hope he himself is that assurance he himself is our refuge and so with that in mind and having set down a, a biblical definition for what or for who hope is let's look at our passage here in romans chapter 8 the first thing we see is that we have the hope that god is for us we see this in verses uh, 31 through 34 and I want us to stop here and, and let that truth sink in. That we have the hope that God is for us. That is what Christmas is about. That God is for us in spite of us being against him. God is for us in spite of us being against him. And, and as you and I think about our struggles, our shortcomings, perhaps this week, our, our failures, or our insecurities, our, our, our sinful inclinations, I want this truth to wash over me and over us, that God is for us. And Christmas is, the, is that manifestation, that expression that God is for you. That God is not against you. That God is not a vengeful God looking for how to get back at us for, for, for committing cosmic treason for shaking our fists at him, saying, you will never rule over me. No, God is not a vengeful God. He's nothing like the, the pantheon of Greek gods and Greek mythology, looking how to trip up mankind and, and make them suffer for angering them. No, here's the first hope that Paul outlines in verses 31 and 32, that Jesus in Christ Jesus, or that God in Christ Jesus gives us the hope, the confidence, the assurance of redemption and not revenge reconciliation not retribution grace not judgment god is for us because he didn't just extend you and i mercy he went all the way and he gave us grace there's a distinction between mercy and grace mercy is not getting what you deserve grace is getting what you do not deserve there's a distinction there god is so much for us that not only did he extend mercy but he gave us Grace And what is that grace? Verse 32. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? And so then the Apostle Paul would say that even while we were yet sinners, the enemies of God, God was for us. And again in verse 32, if God was for us even, when we were, uh, even before we were his children, how much more so do you think God is for you as your father so then he says who can condemn us in verse 34 who can bring any charge against us verse 33 it is god who justifies in my failures this week and, and in my shortcomings god is for me and christ is my righteousness 
And, and I need to hear that, church, and I believe so do you. I need to remind myself that God is for me because he is good and gracious, not because I have worked hard this week and behaved. God is for us not because we've earned it, but because he gives us grace. And, and, and the, the beauty, the, the hope of Christmas is this, that God is, is for you and I. He's always been for us. And that truth is manifested in the incarnation of Jesus at Christmas. And, and it goes hand in hand with what Paul also says in uh, Romans chapter 6, but also in other parts of his letters to the Ephesians and to the Colossians, to the Galatians, to the church in Corinth that because we have that hope and because we have this, this new heart, because we, we have Christ not only come to us, but come in us, he is in our lives, he has transformed our lives, our hearts, th then we don't want to break his heart anymore. We want to live out faithfully because we have that hope, and that hope is not cheap, it's precious. And that hope is steadfast, it's not counterfeit. So behold the hope of Christmas. That God is for you and for me. Second, we see that we have this hope that is greater than our greatest fears. We see this in verses 35 and 30 through 37. And again, it's so important for us to be reminded over and over again that our hope, our assurance, our confidence that we have in God is never dependent on circumstances. Instead, we are dependent on that assurance, on that hope of God's love to carry us through those difficult circumstances and life's unpredictability. And the entire chapter in Romans 8, Paul has this beautiful explanation of the hope that that early church in Rome were to hold on to. And, and we today, this morning, were called to hold on to that same hope in the midst of the weight of life's burdens because we, just like the early church, understand the weight that we live under this burden of sin and that the world is just not as it should be. That the created world is, is not fully restored yet. And in Romans chapter 8, earlier in verses 22 through 25, Paul highlights his own personal troubles. And I believe we can relate to some of them. He talks about the fact that tribulation or, or, that, or that, tr that troubles are real. That there are times in our lives as believers where the hits just keep coming. And that's real. That the stress and anxiety, that, that is real. That's a reality of our lives. That sometimes for believers, that, that, that we might even lack some of the basic needs. And that is real. There's believers all around the world right now who are suffering from not having enough to eat. Not having a roof over their head. Meeting in caves and meeting in hidden places as a church because of persecution. And, and, and those are realities. Those are hardships that, that believers endure. That there's dangerous work conditions, there's life-threatening accidents and illnesses, and, and those are all real. But if those are real, then we need a hope. We need a confidence that is greater than our greatest trouble. We need a hope that is greater than our greatest moment of despair. And so here is our hope. Here is our confidence that Jesus has come into these realities. He stepped in. He does not dispense from afar, but he comes in. And the reason that is hope, the reason that that is confidence, is because Jesus not only steps in, but he's experienced and he understands all of our troubles, all of our distress, all of our needs. The Apostle Paul would say, I have learned to be content with much and with little, and hunger and being full when I'm thirsty and when I have plenty to drink because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Well, Christ strengthens me because God, Christ knows what I'm going through because he himself has gone through that, but he's come out victorious and therefore he is our very help in our time of need. That is the hope of Christmas. That is the hope that we have that even in the darkest night, light has come. Even in the most hopeless situation hope has come and so jesus identifies with us in those things and that is a hope that we have because not only does he identify over them with us in them but he's also victorious through them 
And I love, again, what Paul writes to the church in Corinth. He says, we have this, this treasure, we have this, this hope, this gospel, in this easily broken jars of clay. Our bodies are these, these, these jars of clay. He says, we're afflicted, but we're not crushed. We're perplexed, we're confused at what's happening in our lives at times, but we're not driven to despair. We're, we might be persecuted or ostracized, but we're not forgotten. We're struck down and belittled, but we're not destroyed. And so we do not lose heart. Why? For we have a hope because of this light and momentary affliction is preparing for us this eternal reward and this weight of glory that is beyond all that we can imagine and comprehend. We have the hope that in the midst of this light and momentary affliction, tongue in cheek, he's in prison, he just got beaten, he's about to be executed, this light and momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory far heavier, far greater than anything this world can offer. And so we don't put our hope in what is seen and the here and now, but rather with confidence we put our hope in him who is with us and loves us until that day when our hope becomes sight, when our confidence is not just validated, but is absolutely confirmed and fulfilled. We have this hope. It's unshakable. It's unmoving, and we await that day when we are able to enjoy the hope that has held us and led us through, Christ himself. And so this is the hope of Christmas, that Christ has come, took on flesh to renew and remake everything and everyone that has been broken by sin. Last but not least, we have a hope. Oops. We have a hope that guarantees life. Verses 38 through verse 39. And all of these nine verses in this passage this morning uh, shout this important theme. And that theme is the assurance that we will never again be separated from God. The hope is that never again will anything separate us from God. Nothing will ever separate us from the love of God. Nothing again will, will ever separate us from the hope that we have in God. And all these nine verses you can almost imagine Paul loudly exclaiming this good news. I am convinced, and I have this hope, that he who holds me is faithful. That we who trust and follow Jesus will never face separation from God. What an assurance. That come what may, it will never separate us from God. It will never separate us from the love of God. And, and every area of our lives is restored and renewed never to face death again. And that is the hope of the gospel. Not only is reconciliation between God and man met, but that the gospel would then affect and change every area of my life. That every area of my life would bring life where there's separation relationally. Maybe there's, there's, there's tension building within family, within marriages, that that is then reconciled because we've been reconciled to Christ. And Paul goes through this list and he points out how nothing and no one can separate us from God again. Physical death, do your worst. Paul says, I am guaranteed to never die again. And this is beautiful picture and beautiful explanation of what death is for the believer. It is not death, it's actually called falling asleep. That those of us who are believers, though we physically die, we are not, set, we as believers never die. We're never separated again from God. It is, it is called falling asleep so that the same way you and I, when we put our heads down at night, when we fall asleep and then we wake up in the morning, that is what death is like for a believer. You go to sleep and you wake up in the presence of God. And there's this beautiful picture of the fact that we're never going to be separated again. But when we wake up, we wake up in the full reality of our hope. Death has no bite, has no sting for a believer. Will, will the troubles of this world separate me? Come what may, for it is well with my soul. Horatio uh, Spafford penned this beautiful hymn called It Is Well With My Soul. It goes like this. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. For me, be it Christ, be it Christ, hence to live. If Jordan above me shall roll, no pain shall be mine, for in death as in life, Thou will whisper thy peace to my soul. No matter the brutality of life, church, no matter the heartbreak of loss, and especially in those things, 
then we can never be separated from the love of God and the presence of God, because that is unchanging. He lists out angels and demons and powers. Though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and hath shed his own blood for my soul. Satan can accuse, but he can never separate us from God again. Satan and, and his demonic minions can oppress, but they can never possess the life of a believer ever again. Past, present, future, neither our past sins nor our future failures can separate us from God who is for us. And again, this does not mean that we walk in disobedience, but instead it prompts us to remember the grace and kindness of God that would lead us to that, that hope, to that repentance, and to that dependence. And nothing else in all of creation, nothing created, nothing imagined, nothing and no one can separate or can take away the life and the hope and the love that God's given to us in his son. And, and that is the hope of Christmas. That is the confidence, the assurance that we have, that we celebrate this morning, and that is the hope that we look forward to fully experiencing at his second coming. So in this, there's a question for all of us this morning. Do you actually have this hope, or are you living your life on wishful thinking, thinking that your, that your performance will lead you to have hope for eternity? Perhaps you grew up in the Christian faith and, and knowledge of God, knowledge of hope should be okay for you. And that is wishful thinking. That is not true hope. Perhaps for you today, all you can think about is, you know what, I'll be okay because I'm not as bad as the person sitting next to me or the person in class. That is wishful thinking. And what Christ offers for you this morning is not wishful thinking, but it's hope, confidence, assurance and, and and the birth of christ at christmas reminds us and prompts us to say this that my assurance my hope is not in what i can offer god but what god has offered to me in sending his son do you have that hope this morning if not it is here for you today do not think that that it that do not think that you're guaranteed tomorrow we're not guaranteed tomorrow, but that hope is for you th this moment, this day. And, and oh, it may be glorious to, to think that maybe even this morning, Christ would be born in someone's heart. Oh, would it be just glorious for us to imagine that as we celebrate the coming of Jesus on earth, the incarnation of Jesus on earth, that perhaps for some of you, maybe one or two of you this morning who aren't yet believers, that Christ would now indwell you. That he would be your Emmanuel, God with you, your hope, your confidence, and your assurance. Will you pray with me? God, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the assurance that we have in you. Thank you for the assurance that we have in Christ, our Savior, and that this hope does not disappoint. That this assurance will never let us down. And we think that even this morning, as we are able to take just a few moments to not only look at your word, but as we now transition into taking a seat at your table, taking communion together, that all of these are a testimonies and they're, they're a, a reminder of your love for us, of the hope that we have. I pray, God, if there's anyone here this morning who does not have that hope, that you would draw them close to you, that they would find hope for their hopelessness that they would find rest for their restlessness, that they would find life in you. And we thank you that you offer it to all free of charge, that there is no magic words, there are no, no magic steps to take, that all that you call us to do is to come and say, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. I need you, oh, I need you. Please forgive my sins. I trust in what you've done for me. I pray, Lord, that, that Christ would be born in someone's heart this morning, that someone would accept who currently is holding you at an arm's distance. I pray that you would create this miracle in someone's heart this morning. And we ask these things in the glorious name of Christ, our Savior, and our risen King.
Amen.